meeting is being recorded. Uh, this will be posted to the PBS website probably within the next couple of weeks as soon as our web folks can get to it. Um, in the meantime, we can send you the link at any time. So if you'd like us uh, to shoot you an email with that, we're happy to do that. Um, so again, this is Therese from the PBS project. Devin's here too. Not sure if you can hear her off mic. There we go. So she's there. Excellent. So the PBS Connect and Share, welcome to the new school year. Uh, we're going to take the opportunity just to let you guys know um, the, the norms around the PBS Connect and Shares. Uh, these were created in a response to requests from our districts. Uh, people who are implementing wanted to be able to talk to other people who are implementing PBS, get ideas from one another, share strategies, uh, maybe solve problems together. And so that's what the PBS Connect and Shares are all about. So you guys can connect with other implementers and people who are interested in PBS, share your advice and strategies, and uh, maybe as we go along, also boost our knowledge of PBS. So the group norms for these sessions is to use the chat area throughout the session. Uh, Devin is here, and she will be monitoring the chat all the while I'm going through the PowerPoint slides. Um, so she can answer questions if those come up. And she can also call out and um, make sure that we address certain questions or strategies as you guys share them in the chat. As we go, have fun with each other, because this is your time. Uh, this is a relaxed atmosphere. And all that we ask is that you just be respectful of one another and maintain confidentiality. So here we go. So today's session, it's starting the year off right with PBS. So we're going to look at how to use data to plan implementation. We're going to look at some strategies for faculty buy-in, some ideas. We have some resources for teaching social skills and behavior and your core curriculum for behavior. Uh, we have some strategies for family and community involvement. And right at the end, we have a couple slides with a technology bonus, a couple of things that we found over the summer. So it's a new school year, and everything old is new again. So it may be new, or it may be old, <laughs> but it's not business as usual. Um, all of our schools are facing some sort of challenges this year. And for schools who have been doing PBS for a while, they do have some challenges in terms of keeping what they're doing fresh and relevant. Um, remember to be proactive with your program. Your PBS strategies usually are not the same, or they shouldn't be the same from year to year, because they should be responding to your data. So if you've noticed some historical trends in the past, do something to prevent them from occurring this school year. Uh, returning schools, you're also going to be increasing your staff expertise. That takes some time. That takes some training. And you're going to work on building systems so you can implement PBS at the advanced tiers for Tier 2 and Tier 3. If you're a newly trained school, uh, you'll be working hard to build buy-in among your faculty and get active participation from other staff members. Uh, you'll be teaching others about PBS and correcting any misconceptions uh, they might have about our approach or our practices. And then you'll also look at starting to lay the groundwork for Tier 1. So checking out your forms, checking out your data system, uh, making sure you have team meetings, you're looking at data, and things like that. So that's a lot to do. So where do you start? And the answer is to look to your data. The first starting point, if you're doing problem solving, is to look at your annual summaries. And you want to find out, overall, is your core curriculum for behavior sufficient for your students? And so uh, we use the national norms with 80% of your students getting 0 to 1 office discipline referrals over the course of an entire school year. So if you're a returning school or if you're a newly trained school, that's the first place to look to see if what you've been doing in the past is sufficient for the majority of your students. After that, you look and see, is the course efficient for all groups of your students? And you also want to see, are you implementing with fidelity? So this is an example of um, one piece of data you can look at. This is referrals per year per 100 students. And that per 100 controls for changes in the student body. Uh, so if between 2009-10, which is the first column here on this graph, if between 2009-10 and 2010-11 you gained a few hundred students, then you would expect that rate to go up. Except that because it's per 100, it doesn't matter. Um, so whether you had an increase or a decrease in your student body, you can look at your referrals per 100 and compare them year to year to see if overall the rates of behavior have been changing. So if your rates of problem behavior are going up from year to year, then that's one signal that your core curriculum for behavior may not be sufficient. That's just one piece of data that you can look at. To look and see whether your uh, core behavior, core 
behavior curriculum is sufficient for all groups of students, there are a couple different ways you can look at that data as well. Uh, the first report example we have here is the risk ratio report. And if you're a school that uses the RTIB database, this is one of the standard reports you can get at the school level and at the district level. And if not, then email your PBS TA person or your PBS coach. We can get you a risk ratio calculator. We're happy to share that with you. The risk ratio is nice because it gives you a relative picture of differences between groups. Uh, if you have groups of students and they're, they have a couple of kids who are getting multiple referrals again and again and again, uh, the risk ratio ignores that. So those frequent flyer students don't have too much of an impact on your overall picture. And then to interpret the risk ratio, what you want to do is aim for all groups to have about a 1.0 risk ratio because that would indicate even risk for all groups. The further away you get from one is the more over or under represented a group is. And with problem behavior, we're particularly concerned with over representation. We don't want to have high risk ratios like 3.1 or 2.21. Uh, those are pretty high. They have three or two times higher risk than all other groups of students. So that's one way of looking to see is your course efficient for all groups of students. Another way is to look at a simple comparison. And that takes the percent of students in the school. So in this example here, we're seeing that African American students make up about 20% of the student body. They're actually accounting for about 34% of the OSS days, out of school suspension days. And they're accounting for about 50% of the in-school suspension days. So we would expect that the percent of days accounted for by African American students would be pretty close to their percent of the student body. So when we see big differences, then we know that something may be going on. Now with the comparison report, it's pretty easy to understand. But if you have students that get multiple referrals in a group, uh, then they do have a big impact on this report. So it's important to know the difference, uh, depending on what piece of information you're looking at. All right, so here's your first chance to connect with others and share some information. How are you disaggregating your behavior data? Are you doing it by race and ethnicity, ESC status, grade level, gender, all of the above? Let us know. Type into chat. Now, we do have some schools that are actually not disaggregating their behavior data. That's OK. Uh, let us know. What do you think? Are rates of problem behavior improving for all groups of students? Awesome. We're hearing from the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, getting multiple attendees typing responses. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, a lot of schools are still working on disaggregation. Rates improving for all groups. That's great, Carol. Do you, um, can you share how you know? And on gender. Excellent. This is great. I, I love seeing the typing here. We'll give folks another minute or two to type in there. And then as we go along, if you see interesting information in the chat, go ahead. You can chat back to that person. You can do it either privately, or you can just do it in the main chat window there. So we have gender. We had grade level. And then Carol disaggregates the data, and they compare it to the previous year. So that's how you know it's going down. That's terrific. Sometimes you look at spe specific students, all groups. Excellent. All right. So Ricky Bell is looking at um, referrals or suspensions for African American male students. So you've kind of disaggregated across two groups, gender as well as race, ethnicity. Great. So behavior specialists are sharing data with each school and each dorm, because you guys do have a special campus. That's great. So that's good. So it is a first step. So when you're doing problem solving, um, the first step in problem identification is to figure out, is your core curriculum sufficient? And after you've answered that question, then the very next question is to know, is it sufficient for all groups of students? So this is something where if you guys are not currently disaggregating, uh, then you want to look and see how your data system will support that. Okay. 
So moving on, the next question to look at to evaluate overall how you're doing with behavior is you want to look at your implementation fidelity and see are you implementing with fidelity. Okay, so what we're looking at here is just a school level benchmarks of quality score and you guys can get these from your PBS coaches. Just log into the PBSES data system. Uh, what we see in this example is that 2011-2012 uh, uh, they had a drop in fidelity and that happens from year to year. Um, things change. We saw a couple of particularly low areas with the implementation plan and in the lesson plans area. And again, those are areas where we see lots of times where schools are scoring lower than others. So your benchmarks of quality, that's a fidelity measure for tier one implementation. That's a great place to start to see if you're implementing your core with fidelity. Another way to look at it is by using faculty surveys. or This would tell you where to start with your data. So you might see with your implementation measure that you have a couple of critical elements that are you know, noticeably lower than others. So that might be one place to start working in terms of what to do for this current school year. Um, but if you're doing faculty surveys, then that would also give you a good place to start. And it may be that your faculty surveys don't match with other data sources that you currently have. And that's what we have in this example here, uh, where staff were asked what do they think is the top problem behavior for their school. And according to the staff survey, disrespect was number one. Based on the office discipline referral data, defiance was number one. Now the school-wide PBS team can identify that as an issue and try to figure out exactly what's going on there. So you move into problem analysis and come up with a number of different reasons why you might have those differences or what the root problem may be. Or you could just take your staff's word for it. <laughs> if you do that, then you'll have faculty buy-in from the get-go. They've identified a problem and so now you're responding to it. Now you may be able to craft your strategies in a way that will um, target disrespect as well as defiance because we know that those are pretty similar categories um, and a lot of things that you do for one can also benefit the other. Yet another strategy to determine where to start for this year's plans is by looking at last year's action plan or at the action plan you completed during your PBS training over the summer. Um, this is just an example that we have we use during trainings. And uh, what this has, this is a, a record of what needs to be addressed. And everything on here is organized by the critical element. Uh, so we identify the critical element that we're working on. We're identifying what needs to be done. All those little activities that go into making that goal happen. The people responsible for each activity. And the date that we're going to follow up on it. Your action plan is a living document. Uh, so as you complete things, go back, cross it off. And if you need to, highlight things and follow up and make sure that they get done this coming school year. So now you guys let me know which critical elements does your team need to work on this year and which ones will you start on and why. Go ahead and type in the chat. Let us know what you guys are doing, where you guys are starting. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to look at getting some continued buy-in. You got to have buy-in before you move forward. Absolutely. Getting students motivated. Faculty buy-in. Excellent. I'm glad we have some strategies to address that coming up. Getting everyone back to PBS. That's good. Everyone needs a refresher now and then, reminding folks what the basic principles are, what the basic strategies are, our philosophy, our approach. Teaching new staff members, excellent. Early intervention, very nice. So we're starting to get to a preventative approach. Excellent. So Carol's sharing a strategy here. We're going to pair new staff members, I'm guessing, with a veteran expert. Great way of building capacity. Great. All right. And then we have CCPS. Uh, let's see. Faculty and student buy-in to new ideas. Excellent. Very good. You guys really hit the nail on the head. And like I said, I'm glad we got some faculty buy-in strategies coming up. 
Okay, so those particular, those first graphs that we looked at, those were overall systems evaluation. So overall, how is your core working for you? And regardless of what you find, if your core is sufficient, you still need to look at implementation planning. So month to month, what will you do with PBS? And if your core is not sufficient, you still have to figure out month to month, what are we going to do for PBS? So the big five reports are really good places to turn. You can review previous year's data to identify historical trends. So if last February you had a particular spike in problem behavior right before the FCAT, then you know this year in February it's a good time to start doing a little extra teaching, a little extra prevention, a little extra rewarding. So the monthly referral rate can be helpful for that, as well as those other big five reports, location time, problem behavior, motivation, and admin decision. So those are good starting points. You guys tell me, if this were your school's data, when would you increase the intensity of what you're doing with Tier 1 for behavior? So we're looking at the average referrals per day per month here. Um, it's uh, also known as the monthly referral rate. So when would you increase the intensity of what you're doing at Tier 1? In January. All right, Leslie, how come January? Right after winter break, that's right, everybody needs a reminder. We've got some others jumping in. This is terrific. At the first sign of an increase, absolutely. So CCPS, you guys, might you go back to December? Certainly possible. There's no real wrong answers here. So yes, you might even start back in December, where you can look at new initiatives from September to October. Yeah, because it was going up in October as well. Springtime is testing time too. That's right. Everybody's patience is thin that time of year. The other thing is, with testing during that time of year, it's hard to teach. It's hard to reward. So that might be another reason that problem behavior tended to spike. And anxiety, yep, <laughs> that's a big one. I can relate. OK. <laughs> Very good. Excellent participation, guys. You're doing great. So regardless of what you're deciding to do and when you're deciding to do it, you need to have your faculty's buy-in in order to actually get it done, because it's not just on your shoulders. This is something that's expected of every staff member, every adult in the building. Uh, so you have to have faculty buy-in. The key to getting people uh, to go along with your changes is to make it personal, relevant, and concrete. So it's really clear for everybody. Um, if you want people to do something different, they need to have a reason. If they don't see a reason to change what they're doing, then they're not going to change. Um, they also have to understand personally how what they're being asked to do will impact them. So whether that means specifically looking for students who are demonstrating expectations, uh, looking across different groups of students to make sure that they're rewarding uh, in equitable amounts, um, making sure that they're attending the problem behavior equally across students, that sort of a thing. You want to emphasize the benefits as you're doing that so that they understand, yeah, this impacts them perfectly, but or this impacts them personally, but you know they can get some good out of it too. Make sure that you get input from your staff, share results. So anytime that you ask for your staff's opinion, make sure that you share back what they told you, what you're doing as a result of that. And then other things to not forget would be get good modeling from leadership. You got to walk that walk and talk the talk. Uh, make sure that you build in a support system so that it's easy to do those new things. And always teach and reward your staff exactly what you want to see. And that's a question that we get from schools a lot, is they want to implement Tier 1 PBS, but they can't get their staff to go along. Well, then you need to teach your staff what's expected and reward them for doing it so they have another reason to participate. Now, buy-in strategies. Um, the first bullet point really says it all for me, is just to share your data, because that will open the dialogue for problem solving. You'll get fresh ideas, fresh perspectives, and everyone will understand why you're proposing what you're proposing to do or looking for input on how to solve a particular problem. Uh, the slide lists a few different ways of sharing your data, some different reports to provide and, and different things to look for. 
You can also conduct surveys so that you're incorporating stakeholder feedback and suggestions and getting other people's perspectives. And then the other thing to do is to provide regular updates. If you do it once a year, maybe twice a year, people forget that things are actually going on or that they're supposed to do something as a result. So keeping it on people's radar so that they know it's important. What we have here is another strategy. And a lot of times when we look at getting um, faculty buy-in or, or staff input into things, we focus on the problems and what is not working. And this is actually the PBS flip of that. So we want to look at what's working uh, regarding a certain idea. So this is a little web that we have. In the center is your key concept. So in this example, it would be PBIS implementation. Um, so then you have, of course, a whole number of different ways of looking at PBS. There's student involvement, staff commitment, fa family engagement. You could add others like uh, data systems, forms, minor referrals. Whatever it is that's an issue for your school, you put up there connected to your key concept. And then for each one of those categories, going along the outside of your key concept, um, you have your staff provide ideas about what's working with each of those areas. So that way you leave a little bit more pumped up, a little bit more positive. And people who maybe were on the fence about different things, they may see it, oh, it's working for our colleagues. Well, maybe I'll give it a shot this year as well. Another way to get faculty input, keep it fresh year after year, is to have an annual PBS theme. Um, so one example, a, a school used a build them up theme to recognize their staff. Um, they provided a hammer to show staff who were building up their students. Um, West Navarre Intermediate School up in Santa Rosa County, uh, their kids were really into Harry Potter. And this example is maybe a year or two old now. Um, but what they did, the, the principal dressed up like a wizard. And they had a whole ceremony, uh, very much like what they do in the movies. And uh, the whole theme was making magic happen at West Navarre Intermediate. And so their reward event, instead of just doing the, the typical pizza party or snow cone party, their rewards were actually going out into the community and doing community improvement projects. So they were getting community participation. They were teaching students all kinds of great life lessons. They were making a difference in the neighborhood. So that was a nice way of keeping it fresh. Now, if you're in a secondary school, um, or really you could do this at any level, is you could have the junior class or the fourth grade class or the seventh grade class uh, pick the annual theme for the next school year. So you can have a, an election process, or you could share some data with your students and have them decide based on what's going on in their school. Another idea, if you're using a token or raffle system, redesign the tools so that they represent the theme or the catchphrase for the next year. Uh, that helps prevent counterfeiting from year to year, so kids aren't stockpiling tokens or rewards um, over their whole course with the school. And it also keeps things fresh. All right. So let's hear from you guys. What are some things you have done to encourage your faculty to participate in PBS? Let's hear from you guys. All right, I'm seeing the ideas pour in. This is terrific. Um, Lynn, you mentioned that you developed staff incentive lists. Can you uh, share what some of those incentives were? Or um, I don't know, you might just be doing that for this current year. But we're interested. We love hearing about new ways of incentivizing our colleagues. Uh, so let's see, CCPS, Faculty Incentives for Participation. OK, yeah, let's hear some examples. What have you guys done to reward your faculty? Oh, excellent, Andrew. You already asked that question. <laughs> I love it. All right, Jason, Olympic themes, Survivor, uh, building the PBS planner on the mascot. That's really good. Okay, the tokens for our students, they also provide incentives for the faculty. So they're rewarded when the student's rewarded. Very nice. I would be rewarding kids that way, particularly if there's chocolate, some downtime, whatever it may be. 
Incentive tickets and drawings were made during faculty meetings. <laughs> Very nice, Andrew. <laughs> Excellent. So we have some special parking spaces. Uh, the principal takes your class for the day. Ooh, the whole day? I want to work at that school. That's nice. We give gift cards, movie tickets, comp time, draw names on the news every other day. That is terrific. All right, so we have ice cream social with all staff and students with music, dancing, hula hoops, etc. So I'm guessing that some of these activities are to pump up your faculty and get them excited. Uh, some of these activities, it sounds like they're rewarding staff for rewarding students. So we're getting them to participate that way. Let's see, we partnered with an insurance company that gives a crystal apple and they provide staff lunches. That sounds nice. Excellent. So I think that one of the keys with faculty buy-in is as you're recognizing your faculty, make sure that you're tying it back to your school-wide expectations and your expectations around implementation. So if you want them to reward a certain number of students, then that's what you're rewarding them for. If you want them to teach your students particular lesson plans throughout the year, that's what you're rewarding them for. If you want them to contribute ideas, um, about the data at the school, maybe some ideas for problem identification or analysis, then as they submit ideas, that's what they're being rewarded for. So excellent. That's why you're tying back your incentives to what you want your faculty to do. Excellent. Thank you for sharing, you guys. That was great. All right. So then, you've got your faculty buy-in. You know what your priorities are in the school, so it's time to design some interventions. Now remember, with PBS, we are proactive, educative, and reinforcement based. So we hear from schools lots of times, um, the reinforcement piece comes pretty easy. That's where people like to start. Uh, but many times, the teaching piece or the prevention piece, um, those don't get as much attention. So if you have data from prior school years, you can use those to identify what needs to be teach and what, well, what needs to be taught. Let me try again. It's getting late in the day. <laughs> what needs to be taught and when it needs to be taught to prevent problems again this current school year. Now, to help you with some of that teaching piece, uh, we provided in the handout file that you can see at the top of the Adobe Connect Room. Um, Right now, all I see is starting the year three times. Those are actually three different files. Uh, one of them is the PowerPoint handout. One of them is instructional strategies. And the other is prerequisite social skills. If you haven't clicked on those and downloaded them to your computers yet, I really encourage you to do that. Um, if not the PowerPoint, at least the two other resources on instructional strategies and social skills. Um, what those are are excerpts from our new, about to be released, classroom consultation guide. We are so excited about this one. Um, the instructional strategies is a multi-page document, page upon page, of different types of instructional strategies, different ways of teaching. And it's not limited to behavior, but certainly you can use those to teach behavior. For just about every strategy, there's a link to somewhere on the internet that shows an example of someone actually using that strategy. Uh, so the, the TA specialists here on the PBS project, um, they knock themselves out just finding every resource they could, every idea they could um, in order to provide that for you. So that'll be in our new classroom consultation guide and it's also here in the chat as a handout. Um, and then right along with that, I'm actually going to jump ahead one slide there. Uh, the other handout is the social skills that are needed in order for students to participate in those different instructional strategies. So if, according to the uh, Common Core State Standards, they want kids to do peer collaboration, well, they need to have a lot of different kinds of social skills in order to do that successfully. Uh, if we want to use concept maps, 
Uh, there's a few less that you need to do, but there's still some things they need to be able to do, like listen, uh, use self-control, and contribute to the discussion. Okay. So you guys can see for the different types of instructional strategies, debates, generating and testing hypotheses, demonstrations, responding, self-monitoring, games, and questioning. Um, it's about three pages of the different kinds of social skills that are needed for those different kinds of instructional strategies. All right. So then what were those strategies? The beach ball. And I bet you guys can guess what some of these are. Uh, but the beach ball strategy is where you take one of those inflatable beach balls and a permanent marker. You write those expectations or behavioral skills or rules, whatever it is that you want to teach. You write them on there on the beach ball and you toss it around the room. Wherever, and when a student catches the ball, wherever their right hand lands is the skill that they need to demonstrate. Three facts and a fib. Students write three examples of the school-wide expectation and one non-example of the school-wide expectation. And they partner with another student to try and identify their buddy's fib. So that can be a lot of fun. And if they're really trying to fool their buddy, then hopefully they'll stay away from the really risky examples or non-examples. All right, I see a comment here from Jason. He's heard of a couple schools using the Common Core standards to align with expectations. Absolutely, it's helped with buy-in and it's helped reduce that feeling, I'm, I bet, where they just have a million different things thrown at them at once. Because this is all part of the same approach, where we're teaching common things and we're moving kids along to be successful uh, to those expectations. That was good. Thank you for sharing that, Jason. Uh, so let's see. We did three facts and a fib, the student surveys. That's where the students actually create, administer, tabulate, and graph the results of surveys. And those can be for PBS. That's a great way to get participation from your students and getting their perspectives and buy-in. Um, or it could be about anything. Knowledge checklists. That's where you write the different things you want the students to know, whether it's school-wide expectations, your different character, tra uh, character traits, pro-social uh, social skills, um, whatever it is that, that you want them to know. You write them down on a piece of chart paper and students identify whether they can define what that particular idea is, uh, if they've seen what that idea is, or if they just don't know if they're not sure. Stump the teacher is fun. That can be um, really engaging for the teacher and for the students. And that's where the students develop questions related to the school at expectations and they try to stump the teacher. And now um, it kind of balances things out because the teacher can then turn it around and come up with questions to try to stump the students. And then the personal project is just what it says. Uh, it's where a student identifies a personal goal and they use that goal as a project that they work on throughout the year. So you got some self-monitoring going on in there. All right, so let's hear from you guys. What is your favorite strategy for teaching your core curriculum for behavior? What have you seen that you love? Let us hear it. As you guys are sharing, Devin and I are discussing um, about Jason's comment earlier with a couple of schools using the Common Core Standards to align with the expectations. And Jason, if you're still around, if you could elaborate on that a little bit more, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, we know the Common Core State Standards, they have the recommended readings for the different grade levels. And uh, what we kind of assumed that was is that those readings, the main theme, was related back to the school-wide expectations. But if it's something else or different or additional, we would love to hear about that. OK, so let's see. Second step, 
great resource. Love their stuff. They have pictures. They have videos. It's lots of fun. Uh, let's see, community projects and dorms. Excellent. Classroom morning meetings. Uh, doing lots of review and students using different methods to respond, such as choral response boards. That's great. Make sure that you have that active engagement. Uh, let's see, we're using Justin's Renaissance program and tailoring it to your school's needs. So pause before your post for social media. I love that. Great advice. Uh, that's good for the teachers, too. Uh, let's see, just in general, not for that school. <laughs> All right, so a monthly read aloud that correlates with the character trait or the word of the month. Nice, and so that's projected throughout the school on the closed circuit TV. Uh, let's see, Jason, I may know someone who loves to dress as a school mascot to do PSAs for the morning announcements. That's right, and for some reason, the, the panda jumps into mind <laughs> where we had a panda running around teaching the expectations. That's a lot of fun. Uh, let's see, so we have uh, from Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, mentoring young ones by older students. That's terrific. Terrific. All right, guys, great strategies. Now, if you're reading something from someone else and you'd like more information, again, feel free to type in the chat and ask that person for more. Uh, you can also uh, do a private chat with that person just by clicking on uh, the little chat window, I think, around your chat options there uh, in the chat pod. Okay, so we are into parent and community involvement or family and community involvement. And uh, a lot of this material, actually, I think just about all of it, <laughs> we, uh, we found from Kim Breen and her colleagues at one of the APBS conferences. Uh, they had a really nice presentation a little while back. Um, what this is is a quote from the parent uh, about how parents need a little bit more information about what's going on with school-wide PBS. And so that brought us to the model for FACE. So FACE stands for Family and Community Engagement. And we know that it's one of those critical factors for positive student outcomes. So because it's so important to student outcomes, then it's appropriate to provide strategies with multiple levels of intensity, just like you would to engage your students. You want to try to engage your families and community. So there may be some things that are pretty easy to do that you do with everyone, like sending out newsletters, sending out bulletins, invitations to um, parent night, that sort of thing. You may have some strategies that require a little bit more time, like phone calls home. Uh, you provide those to families who are a little bit more resistant. They're not as likely to participate in what the school's doing. Um, and then you have some families who are very resistant, and it's very hard to get them engaged with the school. And so you have to do a little extra legwork to touch those families and get them involved. So you want to think about providing strategies to engage your families and community uh, at multiple levels of intensity, just like you do with supports for your students. Now, one strategy is to make your school-wide expectations, your core curriculum for behavior, make it meaningful for parents. Uh, so show them what your school-wide expectations are and give them ideas of how that might look in the home environment. So different ways that the student can or their child can demonstrate the school-wide expectations while they're at home. And encourage parents to acknowledge their children for doing that as well. Now, if your parents, if you have um, parents from communities where English is not the primary language or the dominant language, make sure you send that home in their own primary language. Um, so getting students, getting translators to help you translate those ideas into something that's easy for families to understand. Consider including parents on PBS teams. Um, so you would treat a parent member of a PBS team just like you would treat any other member of a PBS team. Uh, so that means including them on all the trainings, sharing information with them just like you would with everyone else. Um, it might mean thinking about some of the things that have been going on in the background at the school and getting the parent up to date on those different um, activities as well. Think about the time of day for your team meetings. A lot of parents can't meet in the middle of the day, so you might have to have a team meeting or two at night after work. Um, keeping communication open and relaxed and making sure that all parents are given the opportunity to participate on the team um, even though they, they, not everyone may have that actual chance to do it, make sure everyone has the opportunity to participate. I think I just actually uh, summarized two slides in one, so we just saved a little bit of time.
<laughs> All right, one point that I didn't cover before is make sure that you listen to, consider, and hopefully implement some of these suggestions and ideas provided by parent members. Make them feel like an actual member on the team where their opinion matters. Okay, another idea is to rotate parents on and off the team um, so that you can have fresh perspectives on a regular basis. Now with communities. How to get communities involved in PBS. Uh, so we have lots of community partners. Many times they provide funding for school activities. Uh, we can go beyond just funding. And we can actually get communities to help us teach and acknowledge school-wide expectations. So those core values that are important to everybody in your neighborhood. So the first step is to identify a community-wide goal or a need. Uh, so if you have particular data that indicates some things, maybe some news stories, um, maybe just some survey information from families or community members, start with that. Think about the people who are impacted about that. So beyond the school, who else cares? Uh, get them involved. Who can help you make an impact? And uh, see what sorts of groups and settings uh, your students regularly go to if they're not in school. So lots of schools have, uh, they partner with the YMCA and they do after school programs. Um, many schools have regular folks uh, or churches that provide after school care. Um, turn to those folks. See what's important to them. See how you guys can work together. Now a lot of times this can be difficult, um, but if you take the first steps and start a collaboration, then in the future you can include that information if you apply for a grant to get additional funding. Uh, so showing a history of collaboration many times makes your grant application more appealing and people are more willing to give you money uh, to keep doing what you're doing. How to get started? Build on what's already working. So if you have three schools in a community and one of them is doing a really good job, maybe they're um, the, the, the person kind of leading the effort with community stakeholders. Uh, make sure again that you're sharing your data. Uh, you can go through the newspaper, district website, community forums, uh, and word of mouth. And then also keep an eye on creating new ways of work or creating systems to support what you're doing with community members. Um, if you're regularly going before um, like the community 4-H uh, club or, or different community groups like that, see if someone is willing to include PBS, community-based PBS, as a regular item on their meeting agenda. That will help make sure that it's always getting included and it takes less effort to reach out and make sure um, that you get on their radar. Now this is an example of a home and community matrix. So just like uh, we had the example where we take the school-wide expectations and we share it with parents and uh, provide different examples of what it may look like at home, um, this is the school-wide expectations with different examples of how it might look in the community. And I believe this was actually for a 5K event that people had and they could participate through walking or through biking. Um, so they were giving ideas about how to prepare the night before, the morning of, and then when they're actually participating in that event. So they had the event and it went off without a hitch. Then, because you're spending time and energy on engaging families and communities, uh, you want to make sure that you're following up and seeing if it's making a difference. Uh, so Kim Breen and colleagues uh, kind of divided that into two groups. They wanted to look at outcome data, so actual survey results, uh, the number of people participating, a number of postcards sent home, number of businesses with expectations posted. Those are all different ways that you can consider. Uh, but they also wanted to make sure that they were keeping an eye on things like the number of surveys returned um, so that they can see are they getting an accurate representation of family and community members' perspectives. Um, they also wanted to make sure that they could identify all the different programs and interventions, all the different strategies they were using to engage family and community members. And then that way, if something wasn't working so good, then they had a resource they could turn to with an idea, well, what can we try next? All right, and I think that that pretty much summed up what I said as well. So we want to make sure that the interventions, the things that they're doing to engage parents and families, or families and community members, um, make sure that they're actually being used, if they're being used consistently and as they were designed. We want to make sure they're effective 
and make decisions about the continuum of supports. So what do they need to keep doing? What do they need to do more of? What do they need to stop doing? All right, so let's hear from you guys. What have you done to increase family and community engagement in your school or your district? And what data do you use to determine if your efforts pay off? All right, we're getting some good ideas. So uh, let's see. Karen at the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, uh, she gives parents some of their dragon dollars, and they can come to the auction and participate as well. Sounds like fun. Let's see, parent engagement workshop, so where they go out and they teach their parents about PBS and love and logic. I'm sorry, love and logic. Let me try and it's getting late. <laughs> First webinar of the year. Parenting classes and literacy workshops, terrific. Love and logic, excellent. Does anyone keep data on how, what percent of their families are responding to their efforts? So Jason, they did a survey. They gave it out to students, parents, and community members. Oh, excellent, to, to find out what they feel is important at a school. That great strategy, Jason. Um, so find out what those core values are for students, families, and community members. And your school-wide expectations need to tie back into those core values. That's great. Had some community members come to PBS training. Nice. I actually heard of a new, newly trained PBS team over the summer, and they included a representative from the NAACP on their school-wide PBS team. Kudos, kudos to them. Our parent info office sends out surveys. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> I think that's terrific. I cannot wait to hear what comes out of that school. I think that's going to be great. Yeah, I, I have a feeling they'll do really well as as well. I, I would agree with that. I expect to see um, much more proportionate outcomes for their students. Uh, so I'm excited to hear. So keep us posted. Excellent. I'm so glad you guys are sharing, that you're typing. Okay, excellent. So maybe one idea moving forward for the current school year is to try to figure out ways that you can measure the impact of your family and community engagement strategies. Um, so you can see if what you're doing is really working or if you need to do something a little bit more or something a little bit different to keep people engaged. Okay. So, oh, excellent. So we've got another um, comment. We have a member of the PTO on the PBS team. And they work with PTO and the volunteer coordinator to get support for monthly PBS celebrations. That's terrific. Those PTOs can unlock lots of resources. So I'm glad that you're including them on the PBS team. All right. So the, the next couple of slides, uh, we just found some resources. Now, we're not endorsing these resources. These are just things that uh, folks found over the summer, and we thought that they were pretty cool. So we wanted to share them with more people. Um, so we haven't used them, uh, but they sound really neat, and other people really like them. So one way to support engagement, there is an iPhone or iPad app called Kid, uh, let me see if I can say it, Kid Pick or Kid Picker. Um, what that does is it's a random name generator, 
and group creator. So it helps you randomly select students uh, to make sure that you're getting around to all students during your lessons. So you can keep track of right and wrong answers, and I believe there's a way for that to provide some auditory feedback as well. So you can get that through iTunes, and it's just 99 cents. If you don't have an iPhone, uh, you can get an app for Android devices called Class Dojo. Um, believe it or not, we found some folks, I believe it was from hmm, the Netherlands at the APBS conference. And they were using Class Dojo a lot to help manage their reward systems. Uh, so you can use it to track positive behaviors. You can give points to students. And it also provides some charts and graphs uh, to help you see how kids are doing. Now, this is one. Uh, these are noise meters. And there's one that you can get for the iPhone uh, that's called Too Noisy, and one for the Android that's called Sound Meter. Uh, so you can download those. And those are actual sound meters. If you're curious about how noisy your classroom is, uh, you can actually download this and start taking some measurements on it. Uh, when your students fall below a certain level, then they may earn a class-wide reward. All right. So that's the end of all the official content that we prepared for you guys today. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone about our next Connect and Share. Uh, Karen Childs will be hosting that one. It's on Wednesday, September 18th. It's a little bit earlier. It's from 2.30 to 3.30 Eastern Time. And what that will focus on is people who are new to your school's PBS team. So we're going to kind of get them boosted up on some basic PBS knowledge, maybe share some strategies so that they feel more comfortable implementing things with your school. <laughs> Jason, do they make that for the cafeteria? That might save the world. I say give it a shot. <laughs> Let's see how it works. And again, um, please let us know how things go. And, and we'll help spread the word so that everyone can benefit from the different strategies. Thank you guys very much for sharing the information. I do have